Okay, so, and then you've heard of dry ice, right? How cold does dry ice get? I'm just gonna put this up a little bit. How cold can dry ice get? Or how cold is dry ice usually in Fahrenheit? Well, it's negative, so, isn't it yeah, negative? It's, it's negative 110. So yeah, negative probably. 110 Fahrenheit, well, 109, but about 110. And liquid nitrogen is negative 320. So it's, it's way colder than dry ice. And I have some in this container here and I can touch the outside of it, but the inside is minus 320. And the reason for that is there's different ways to conduct heat. Uh, one way would be to touch something. If you touch a hot stove, you'll feel that heat right away. Another way is if there's a breeze. So there's conduction is if you touch a hot stove. If there's a breeze, that's called convection. And the other way is radiation. And radiation is a very inefficient way to transfer heat. So this container, it's a container and then a vacuum and then a container. And that the part that's a vacuum is really bad at conducting heat. And now I have a question for the smart people amongst us. To get from the sun to the earth, what does the heat have to go through? If you're going from the sun to the earth, what does that heat travel through? Are you asking the ozone layer or? I'm saying past the earth. There's 93 million miles between the earth and the sun. So most of that distance is pretty much nothing. So you can imagine how hot the sun is. We just said that it's very, a very bad way to make heat flow is to go through a vacuum. And that's what the heat from the sun does to warm the earth. So you can imagine how hot, how hot the sun is. So what I'm gonna do now is pour some liquid nitrogen into this container. This container is, it's similar to this one. It's a container and then a vacuum and then a container, but the, the top is open. So it's not, it's not as good. I can keep liquid nitrogen in this for about two weeks though. So that's, very, it's like a thermos bottle, very insulated. You're gonna see some smoke. The smoke is a real cloud and it's from the water vapor in the air. So I'm pouring some into this container. I want you to hear this boiling now noise because it's going to change. I can't hear it. Does anybody hear it? Oh, you couldn't hear that? Oh, that's too bad. Sorry. We'll come to the live show next year. Sorry about that. Is that Mrs. Kim? Yes, it is. Hi. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, we have some distinguished people in the, in the audience here. <laughs> and is that John Perez? Wow, great. Oh, and there, there's Roger Fisher. <laughs> Glad you could make it. Well, um, so we won't even talk about that because you couldn't hear it. But what we did, we poured some liquid nitrogen into this container. And for a long time, it was boiling away very vigorously. And now it's very quiet. So let me pour a little more into, well, let me just go right on to our next thing. I see some people who know about density. So here I have a cork in a bottle. This is a cork and it's floating in the water. How come the cork can float in the water or on top of the water? Who knows why that can float? Because Mackenzie, do you know? I, somebody said something. 
It's yes, light. yes. This cork, this cork weighs less than an equal volume of water. But when I take the lid off, how come the cork doesn't float up to the ceiling? How come the cork stays on that water? Gravity. Oh yeah, gravity's pushing it down, but it's pushing down on it when it's in the water too. Well, the reason I'm showing this is we're gonna do a similar thing right now. So it's Maker Day in New Jersey. Some people aren't from New Jersey, but there's something called Maker Day. And I wanted to make like a big fish tank because I'm going to put some gas in this. And the gas is a very dense gas. So back here, I have some gas cylinders. And we're going to take some of this gas here. This is a very dense gas. And we're going to be, we're hopefully going to be able to float a balloon in this gas. That balloon has a hole in it. Okay, this balloon, I'm going to pump this up, but I'm going to put some helium and oxygen in. I'm going to put just enough so that it, it doesn't float in air, but it's not too heavy. So let's see if that worked. So that balloon, does anyone say that that balloon floats? Would anyone claim that this balloon floats? No, that balloon no. is not floating. Nope. No one believes that. So I'm going to put this balloon in this Maker's Day fish tank. And the balloon goes down. But then I'm going to put a very dense gas in. Yeah, you can see that fast. So here I've got a tube. And I'm going to put one end on this gas cylinder. And I'm going to put the other end into here. And maybe we could put a pillow on top. I just, I don't want the gas to get out. There. You turn this on. Here comes some gas. You can't see the gas because it's see-through, but it's coming in and the gas is going, it's, it's more dense than the air. So it's pushing the air out of this cylinder. I want to see if I can get around the board there. Now it'll be under it. What's happening? I think the balloon might have gotten stuck. There's also some static electricity. There shouldn't be much because it's a kind of a rainy day. Okay, so what I did or what happened here is we filled up this tube with a dense gas. And so the balloon, the balloon can float in the gas. It can't float in the air, but it can float on top of this very dense gas. Whoa. And it's not the greatest fish tank ever because I just made it out of a piece of plastic and some tape, but that's pretty impressive. So that gas, there's a special name for that gas. It's called sulfur. You've heard of sulfur probably. And then hexafluoride. And you probably know fluoride from your toothpaste. So when you, when you study chemistry, you'll find out that equal 
uh, molecules of each gas are going to take up the same space. So if you have more mass in your molecule, like you think sulfur hexafluoride, that's a pretty big name. So that probably has more mass per molecule than something like helium, which is a small name. So the helium weighs less than an equal volume of sulfur hexafluoride. And it's enough of a difference that it can also lift up, it also lift up the, uh, whatever the balloon is made out of. So let's see if we can get that to float in here. And it's still floating on that sulfur hexafluoride. Okay, I wanna talk about another thing. I'm trying to do some new demonstrations for people who've seen my show before. Another one, we're gonna put some liquid nitrogen into this, this container. It's named after someone whose last name was Dewar. His last name was Dewar, and this is called a Dewar. And these are all called Dewars. And they're that great idea. It's a container, and then a vacuum, and then a container. And again, that, that cloud is a real cloud. We're, we're making a real cloud. It's the water vapor in the air uh, goes from a, a gas to a liquid. And that's what a cloud is also. So now what we're going to do, we'll put this away. I have a, I made a spool of very fine copper wire. So I don't know if you can even see that, how thin that wire is. There's a piece of it right here. It's about as, maybe as big as a hair. Oh, there you can see some in the light. So that's how thin it is. And the good thing about this spool of wire is I can get to both ends of it. And then what I did, I had an old computer and I took the power adapter of the computer and that's what's gonna power this. And now these light bulbs, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but these light bulbs are lit. Where's that camera? Maybe if I put it in front of the, if I put it in front of the dresser, you can kind of see a glow right there in that light bulb. If you can't see it, just kind of humor me a little bit. So now what we're going to do, we talk about uh, metals are good at conducting electricity. So the electrical current can flow through the wire and they make they make wires out of copper for that reason. But what we're gonna do is make the conductivity even better. If you cool down the copper, the electrons don't have as much random energy. So the energy that's left, they can use that to have an orderly flow of current. So I'm putting this in, it's not, it looks like an arrow. I just used an old arrow to make this. It was just a dowel I had. And now we're cooling down, we're cooling down that long spool of very thin wire and it's getting even better at conducting electricity. And now can you see that the lights are lit now? I can move them closer in. So now these lights, you can kind of see that they're lit better. But let me block the sun a little bit. There, that I think you could see that those are lit. Yes, we see. We can see okay. it. Now. Great. So what we've done, we've we've taken something that was already good and we've made it better. We've taken the conductivity of the copper wire or the copper, and we've made it bigger by lowering the temperature. And again, if, if you're a big person, what we could say there is that copper is a good conductor, uh, but at, at room temperature, there's some random motion 
of the, of the atoms or the electrons. If you take away a lot of that random motion, uh, you can have a more orderly flow of electrons. And that's, that's what the conductivity is. The conductivity can increase by cooling down a copper wire. Okay, and this is gonna take a while to heat up. So we'll just, we'll just leave this here. <clears throat> and you hey, can I, see. I have a question. Oh, great. Um, so how do they light up? I know you're getting rid of the resistance or, or what you're saying. Oh, I have, a, I have a computer adapter. So there's like 21 volts across it. Okay. Yeah. So I didn't show it because, oh, I, I, don't, I guess I don't need it right now. He knows. If you ever want to make a Maker's Day project, a fun thing to do is to take a computer power adapter and then you can just put some wire, you can just separate the wire and I put some alligator clips on wires here. The reason why this is fun for a lot of projects is uh, if your hands are dry, you won't get a shock from 21 volts. You need about 50 volts before you get a shock. I think uh, Mackenzie and Killian, I think your dad told me 48 volts. So 48 volts, and this is only like 21 volts. So this is, it's a fun thing if you want a source of power. I'm just gonna plug it back in so we can see the lights actually get dimmer. Okay, so that was that one. What else would we like to see? We've got a bunch of other gases here. And uh, I have a lot of sisters, but I only have one younger sister. And my younger sister taught me a really fun trick that I've been doing ever since. This was maybe 20 or 30 years ago. She taught me this. And what it is, I, uh, I'm gonna put a gas into a balloon and then we'll put the balloon over a test tube and then we'll put the test tube into some liquid nitrogen and we'll see what happens to the gas in the balloon. Okay, this, we're gonna put argon into this blue balloon. So the blue balloon is gonna have argon in it. We should talk about what air is made out of. You can't see air, but it's there. And it's all around us. So what I'm gonna do, I'm not gonna tie the balloon. I'm gonna stretch it over this test tube. So the, the, the gas in the balloon can go from the balloon into the test tube. And we're gonna put this into some liquid nitrogen. So let me see if I can get a container for some liquid nitrogen. So here's just a paper cup. I'm gonna put liquid nitrogen into it. And now I'm gonna put the test tube into, into the liquid nitrogen. A test tube is made out of glass that's a very special glass. This glass doesn't shrink or grow very much as it heats up. If you put liquid nitrogen, if you put a dinner glass into liquid nitrogen, the dinner glass would break because parts of the glass would be shrinking and other parts would still be the same size and that would put a lot of forces onto the glass and the glass would break. So that's argon. And we're gonna, I'm gonna go to another one. I'm gonna make one with oxygen in it. Okay, which one is oxygen? Right here is oxygen. So what I do, I turn the pressure on, and then I bend this, and then I get to turn the pressure off.
And again, what we're going to do, we're going to stretch it over this test tube. I'm just going to let a little go into the test tube first. Whoa. So now it's, it's not tied off. It's over the test tube. Oh, and look what's happened to our argon balloon. Look at this balloon is all shriveling up. So what makes a balloon round like that or spherical is that there's gas inside pushing onto the balloon in all directions. And that pushing in all directions makes it kind of like a ball shape. But now as we cool down the gas, it's not moving as much. It's not banging into the balloon as much. So the balloon doesn't stay a ball it gets kind of shrivelly because there's, we don't think about it, but there's air outside the balloon pushing on the balloon. So here there's a lot of air pushing this blue balloon and there's nothing inside pushing back. So the argon inside couldn't keep the balloon pumped up. And now what's happened is the argon it got so cold that it turned from argon gas to argon liquid. And then it even got cold enough for the liquid argon to turn into solid argon. So let's talk about what air is made out of. Who knows what air is made out of? We got two things right here. And then we're missing another very important one. Well, we have them all because the, the oh. liquid nitrogen is what it, mo, air is mostly nitrogen. And oxygen. then next, yeah, oxygen. oxygen is next. So there's oxygen. And then the third most common gas in air is argon. So we've got the, we've got the top three right in this cup. And what I want to show now, because it, it, uh, it solidified very well. So the argon, it went from a gas to a liquid. Somebody mentioned gravity. So the gravity kept that liquid argon down at the bottom of the test tube. And then we took away more and more energy and it went to a solid. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna quick pick up this test tube and bring it close to the screen. And you're gonna see at the bottom, there's a little bit of solid argon. And it, if you know chemistry, argon is a noble gas. So there's not a lot of attractive forces from argon to another piece of argon. So it quickly, it's only a liquid, it's only a liquid for a few degrees. So it went from a solid and now we've got, it's boiling away in there. Can you see it boiling away? And then once, once it's all liquid, um, it's going to start. It's going to start turning into a gas, and that gas, um, once it gets more and more heat or more and more energy, it's going to pump up that balloon again. So we'll, we'll put this down over here. We won't put it back into the liquid nitrogen. We'll just put it here and see what happens. Let me just get a different cup, maybe. Okay, here's another cup. And already the, the balloon is getting kind of big. Meanwhile, what happened to our Christmas tree lights? What happened to these lights? They're back to really dim. They're still lit. I don't know if you can see that they're still lit, but there's very dim glow. And that's because the electrons have to go, well, the, the push of the electrons is going through this copper wire. And now the it's, it has frost on it, but it's warmer than it was in the liquid nitrogen. And that's why the lights are dim. We can make these lights bright again 
And again, what, what John Perez asked was, how come they're lit? They're lit because there's electricity. We've got that, we have the laptop computer power adapter is, is uh, putting a voltage across these. So we can, we can make this light up again by putting it back into liquid nitrogen. And it looks like I need to put some more in the doer. So now as we cool down the copper again, the lights get brighter again. And here our argon is back close to room temperature and our balloon is, is getting pumped up again. So now, now the argon atoms are pushing, they're moving around and they're pushing on the balloon and they're moving in all directions. And there's so many atoms, there's so many atoms that it makes it like a perfect round shape. Like we can't see kicking or hitting on that. Meanwhile, our oxygen has turned to a liquid. So that, that it's a pale blue color, that's liquid oxygen. One very interesting thing about liquid oxygen is that it's attracted to a magnet. It's called paramagnetic. So I've got some strong magnets here. And what we'll do, what we'll do is see if we can attract some of the liquid oxygen. So here is liquid oxygen. I'll see if I can move any up. And I do, I moved it up and the test tube, it's still cold, but the test tube up at the top was so much hotter than the test tube at the bottom that I'm bringing oxygen up and it boils away and it pumps up the balloon. <clears throat> so I, didn't, I don't know if you could see the uh, liquid oxygen follow the magnet uphill but it was going uphill with the magnet. It's going uphill with the magnet. And then since it goes up to where the test tube is hotter, it boils away quickly up there at the top. Okay, let's put some more liquid nitrogen into here and we'll make this go in the other direction again. Okay, and we've seen these, these light bulbs lit up. Let me cool this down again. And now we're going to take another gas, another famous gas that's in the air, just a tiny bit of it is in the air, is carbon dioxide. So the humans, the animals need oxygen, and the plants need carbon dioxide. It's a, it's a great team how we could work together there. And so I'm going to, I'm going to fill up a balloon with carbon dioxide. That has a hole in it. Sorry about the holes in these balloons. I haven't done a balloon show in a while. Okay, I think this is green, which would be good for carbon dioxide because the plants need carbon dioxide. And we've got a test tube here ready. So again, this, this is called a regulator. It regulates how much of the gas comes out. And I'm gonna stretch this. So this has carbon dioxide in it. I'm gonna put some in here. And now we're gonna put this over here. So the balloon isn't tied up. We're gonna put the balloon, the balloon is over the test tube and now we're gonna put the test tube into our liquid nitrogen. Meanwhile, our, our balloons here 
with our argon and our oxygen, the balloons are now deflated. I want to show you the argon again. So let me quickly bring it over. And I, I don't want it to be in the glare of the sun. So I'm going to stand right on the side of this. Hopefully you'll be able to see some solid argon. That's solid argon. Probably never seen that before. And it went, it's in the bottom of the test tube because it first liquefied and then the liquid argon was in the bottom of the test tube. And then as you took more energy away, it went from a liquid to a solid. And now the carbon dioxide goes down very quickly because remember we said liquid nitrogen is minus 320 and the carbon dioxide is only minus 110. And the other thing about carbon dioxide, which is uh, for me is very amazing, is that it doesn't become a liquid. It goes right from a gas to a solid. And what's happened here, we have a solid all over the test tube. It's not just down at the bottom, it's all the way up and down. And that's because the, the carbon dioxide goes right from a gas to a solid. So wherever the gas molecules hit the cold um, test tube, that's where it turned to solid. So dry ice is famous for taking on picnics and things. And the reason why is if you put ice, if you put ice in a cooler and then you go play a game and then you come back, it's time to eat, your food will be all soggy. So the great thing about dry ice is your food doesn't get soggy. And that's because the carbon dioxide goes right from a solid to a gas. Now we can see some down at the bottom. There's some solid carbon dioxide. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna try to get some out of this test tube. But you can see if that was a liquid, you wouldn't have a, you wouldn't have a space there that would be full of liquid. So that's a solid. And let me again wipe this off. Okay, so we've got some, and we've got some wiggling around down there. So what I'm gonna do is get a spot on the table that we'll be able to see, maybe in this lid here. I'm gonna try to get the carbon dioxide to come out. And I got some to come out. I don't think you can see that though. There's some dry ice. Oops, <laughs> now it's on this tabletop. So we've got some dry ice in this pillbox lid. And let me see if I can get more. What I'm doing, when I wipe the outside of this test tube, when I wipe the outside of this, I'm just gonna admit Kathy. Kathy, I think you've been admitted. So I'm gonna wipe the outside of this test tube and it gets the, the water vapor turned to ice from the air out, but it also heats up the test tube. And what I'm trying to do, I wanna heat it out oh, and now we've got it to go. So now we can move that around in the test tube. So there's some dry ice, it's in the test tube. And now I'm gonna put it onto this, I'll put it into this little thing here. So we've made a little tube of dry ice uh, there. We've made a tube of dry ice and it's the shape of the inside of the test tube. And it's also hollow. I don't know if you can see that it's hollow. Usually I bring gloves with me and I don't have my gloves. So I'll just grab it with this. Oh, here, yeah, now we can see. We've made a hollow, cylinder of dry ice. That smoke that you see, I think is water vapor, just like with our liquid nitrogen. So unfortunately I have it in a white, here, I'll put it in the green balloon. You don't wanna to touch dry ice with your hands because it's very cold. 
So there, we made a nice cylinder of dry ice. I'll put it in front of the dresser. Hopefully you can see, whoops, I just broke the dry ice. So it was a little, it was a little shell of dry ice. And now, now it's just dry ice. And what we can do is try to see if there's any, any um, liquid. And if we do see liquid, it'll be inconclusive because that would probably be from the water vapor from the air. But I'll keep it in, in this thing and then we can report back later and see if there's any water in there. Okay, we're, we're at the halfway point plus 10 minutes. So this would be a great time if anybody had a question, to ask a question. If not, there's some very exciting things that we want to do next. I got a question. Oh, great. Who is this? This is John Perez. John Perez. Thank you for asking and, a question. And, and Jackson's here. Um, okay. So at work, we use liquid oxygen. and it You do? It. So we use it for burning with a torch. Um, and oh, then, oh, okay. Yeah. But we leave them. I mean, it's probably a vacuum. They're big. It's like. It's got to be like 300 pounds, the, the container. It's probably five foot high, um, 30 inches around. It's pretty big. Yeah. Um, as opposed to those bottles that you have behind you with just regular oxygen. But they're right, bigger. So, so you've got a very big oxygen tank or oxygen cylinder. Yeah. And even these little ones are pretty heavy. Yeah. Like this, this one here. I had, I had to make kind of a sling to carry it because to bend my hand at the bottom of it was kind of pulling my forearm muscles. So, well, the regular oxygens are probably five foot tall and they're, and they're like the same diameter as that one. Uh -huh. um, but the liquids, I was wondering, how do they stay liquid? Like we'll have them for weeks and it'll stay liquid oxygen. Uh, and yeah, it's... It's probably high pressure and also it's probably in a doer. Oh, is it the same diameter as that one? Did you say? No, they're, they're a lot thicker. They're yeah. Okay. Thicker. So that's probably a doer. It's probably a container and then a vacuum and then a container. And at, at my work, we have big doers of liquid nitrogen and those are the same way. It's high pressure, but it's also a very, um, well insulated. And when, when I was filling up this doer to, for this show, a pressure release valve on the big uh, liquid nitrogen doer went off <laughs> and it was right. I kind of bumped into one of the uh, regulator things. So I thought, oh no, I, I, I hit something and now it's leaking. But it was just a pressure release valve went off. Just like if you cook things with a pressure cooker, there's a there's that thing that, that goes this way and steam comes out, but there's also a, a safety pressure relief valve. And the, the same thing on the, on the gas cylinders that we have or the liquid nitrogen cylinder, if the pressure gets too high, it just vents a little bit and will, some will come out. And, and again, if, if you're working with it and one of these vents opens up, it could scare you. Oh, they're so, scared. Yeah. Okay, meanwhile, we still have our dry ice. One thing I wanna say about our dry ice as opposed to store-bought dry ice is our dry ice was at uh, liquid nitrogen temperature. So our dry ice was 210 degrees colder than the liquid nitrogen that you would buy. So this is gonna take even longer. First, it has to go up to the sublimation point of of carbon dioxide. So it has to get up to minus 109 degrees Fahrenheit, and then it has to sublime. So that's going to take longer than a, a dry ice normally would. But the dry ice that you get, sometimes if you get some medicine or, or special something, you get a, a, a big block of dry ice, and that's a big volume. So that would take a long time to sublime too. Okay. Do we have other things to show? We do. 
One other thing I'd like to show is a magnet in a tube. So this is an aluminum tube here. I think it was the boom of a, a microscope or something like that. And here we've got these magnets. Magnets stick to refrigerators. They don't stick to aluminum. But if I drop this magnet down here, we're gonna see it's gonna take a long time to get through. You'd think it would be hard to catch it, but it's actually easy to catch. You've got a lot of time for that to fall through. The reason why is we said copper was a good conductor. Aluminum is also a metal, it's a good conductor. And what happens is when you drop a magnet, these are permanent magnets, but when you drop it, it's changing its position. So that changes something called the magnetic field. Wow, I can feel this fighting. When I, when I move fast, it's hard to move. So a, a dropping, even if it's a permanent magnet, a dropping magnet will be a changing magnetic field. That's gonna create an electric field. If you have electrons that can move, they will move an electric field because that's what an electric field is. It's a push on the electrons. And the way electricity and magnetism works, it goes around in circles a lot. So if you move this down, there's something called the right-hand rule, the current will flow around this. So you're making an electromagnet in the pipe and that electromagnet is gonna fight this magnet. And that's why it takes a long time for this to fall. Okay, and that's a lead in to what we're gonna show next. So next what we have are some superconductors. So uh, we said aluminum is a very good conductor. Copper is a very good conductor. Uh, superconductor, there's no resistance at all. So remember we put the copper into the liquid nitrogen and the resistance went down, but in a, in a superconductor, there's no resistance at all. So instead of slowing down a magnet, it's actually gonna repel a magnet. And it's for a slightly different reasons, but it's a similar reason. So I think we're done with this. It's very weakly lit up right now. I'm just gonna unplug this. and put this away. We still have to do our vacuum stuff. Okay, so now we're gonna do our superconducting track. So this track is made out of magnets. They're going around in a circle. And there's a special material called a superconductor. I think we can see that. There's a special a material called a superconductor. And this superconductor is gonna repel all magnetic fields. So I'm gonna grab one. So this superconductor is actually a very thin film Right here, this is a plastic puck that it's in, but the superconductor itself is just very thin. And what the superconductor is doing, it's repelling the magnetic field. And so it's actually hovering, it's actually hovering on top of that track. So let me see if we can see that. So most of this puck is, most of it is just a, kind of a sponge to keep the liquid nitrogen on there so that the, the superconductor will stay cold. So it's hovering around, it's levitating, it's on top of, of the magnets. Now, if you see a circle, 
a circle is the same all the way around. So here's a circle. If I turn a circle, it still looks like a circle. And it's the same thing with this track. These magnets uh, are looking like the same magnetic field anywhere this is. What I'm gonna try to do is pick this up a little bit. You can see it's not just repelling, it's also held in position. Whoops. Probably got a little too warm, or I might have been a little too rough with it. But here's another puck. So we've got a puck on the track, and I can actually turn the track upside down. So it's not just that it's repelling, it's held in position. There. So there it is going around and around, held in position by that track. And it, it can last for a long time, but I might, have, I might have banged it or something. But we'll cool those down. I'll get the other one. So this is just another, like a phase change or another change. We think of things can be a solid, a liquid, or a gas, but there's other changes that can happen in materials. And these superconductors, they go from, they go from having resistance to having no resistance at a temperature that's higher than the temperature of liquid nitrogen. So that's why these are so fun, because they work in liquid nitrogen temperatures. Yeah, it's just, it's very fun to watch that going around and around. I want to show you something about the, the symmetry here. So a circle looks like a circle no matter how you turn it. But a rectangle, I'd have to turn this 180 degrees for it to look the same. So if we had one of the pucks on here, the magnetic field would be the same, as long as you stay the same distance away from the origin or from the center, the magnetic field will um, be the same for a puck on these circles. But here, if I turn it a little bit, it'll be a different magnetic field. So it, it won't be able to rotate on this, and it will be able to rotate on this. So let's see if we can get, we can show that. So here's, uh, again, the, the superconductor itself is very thin, but this one is on a bigger, in a bigger puck with a bigger, like a bigger sponge on it. So that can go around and around. I just want to show that it kind of stays the same. We could put it right in the center and then it would spin around and around. If we put it out from the center, then it stays kind of that, that radius away. If we put the same thing onto this rectangular track, now you can't get it to spin and you need a force to move it even. And it's again, it's not just repelling, it's also um, it's also, it, it's just stays that distance away. And I think with this audience, we won't talk about the reason why. It's just very amazing that it happens that way. And here we can have this one also. We can have it spin upside down. So it's just, it's locked into position, we'll say. So there's actually, uh, there's actually no wires or things holding it on. It's just levitating there. What we should probably do is see if we can put something in there. What could we put in there? Uh, I don't think I have a piece of paper to put in there. Maybe this baggie. So we've got this baggie between them. 
and it can still rotate and it can still be upside down. Okay, so it's actually levitating there. That's, that's pretty amazing. So this is a good, I don't usually like Zoom shows, but I guess this is a good thing to show on a Zoom show is a close-up thing like this. Pretty neat. We've got six minutes left. We haven't done pressure yet. There's a Warren County resident who generously supplied marshmallows for this. I don't know if she's on in the audience, but it was Linda Channel. I think she's a friend of the library. So what we're going to talk about now is pressure. And what we have here is a bell jar. I think I got this at, uh, at a Hackettstown Spring Festival. I think this is Warren County Community College gave me this flashlight. And it, 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 I should say it works again. I might, maybe I got this 15 years ago. I just put new batteries in it. So if you are from Warren County and you have a flashlight like this, that would be a fun Maker Day project to take it apart and see how it works. And I have extra batteries if I ever see you and you do that. Okay, this is called a bell jar. Can anyone guess why it's called a bell jar? Like a bell. Yes, that's exactly why it's called a bell jar. Now, what else can we put in here? I have some of these bags here. These bags, sometimes if you buy something and it gets shipped to you, it arrives with these fun bags. And what's happening here, there's air inside the bag. If I, if I make the volume smaller, that air is confined to a smaller place. So it, it pushes more on the bag. If I let it spread out, then there's fewer air molecules hitting the bag and it's not as puffed out. But we don't think about it, but there's air on the outside pushing in on this also. But what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put this bag inside the bell jar. That looks like a bell. That's why it's called a bell jar. And I have a vacuum pump over here. Let me just move the camera so you can see the vacuum pump. Here's a nice vacuum pump. That's called a snake plant there. That's not part of the show. This is a vacuum pump. And I'm gonna turn the vacuum pump on after I connect it to the bell jar. So here's the bell jar. This bell jar is on a nice machined base. If you do science shows, people want to help you. And so I told some people that I was doing a science show and they made a base for me just to be nice. I think they were being nice to you by making that base, even though they don't know you. So I'm gonna connect this hose to here and I'm gonna turn this on. And what we're gonna see is that we're gonna take the air out of this jar so normally there's air pushing on the bag from the outside, but we're gonna take away that push from the outside. And then all that will be left is the push on the inside. Oh. So I've turned this on, it has to spark. Now it's sparked. What's happening here? Is this going? Oh, I had this shut. No wonder. Sorry about that. Okay, so what happened was we had air in the bell jar 
Sorry about that. Let's do another one. So now I'm gonna let air back into the bell jar by taking this hose off. And it's like a hurricane for that poor bag in there because the air came rushing in to the bell jar. We're not used to thinking that air can do anything, but windstorms are made out of air. So here we're gonna take the air out of the bell jar. And the bag gets very pumped up. I don't know if it's gonna go. Let's let the air back into the bell jar. And it's like a windstorm on that. So that one didn't seem to pop, but it's definitely flat as a pancake now. Let's do another one. Maybe we should try to do two. I've never tried to do two before. So the bags are puffing up inside the bell jar. Neither one of them popped. And now let's let air back in. And now the bags are kind of deflated. I'd like to do one more thing. Do we have time? Oh no, it's two o'clock already. Let's just end. I just want to see if we can, if we can freeze air. So what we have, we've got some liquid nitrogen and I'm gonna put it in the bell jar. And now any liquid nitrogen that evaporates, we're gonna pump out of the bell jar. So the liquid nitrogen that's left behind is gonna be colder. And we're seeing if we can lower that temperature enough so that the cold liquid nitrogen actually freezes. And I see that we're not, it's not bubbling as much as it was before. And that's because we've kind of, we kind of have a good insulation in it. Let's see if we can get it to freeze. There, it's forming ice on it now. So now there's a layer of frozen air on top of our liquid nitrogen. So what we did, the, the nitrogen molecules with more energy evaporated. The ones that were left behind were colder. They had less energy or colder, and it was enough to freeze the one that the what was left behind. So this is probably the coldest thing you've ever seen. This is frozen air. Um, liquid nitrogen is minus 320. This is minus 346. So there we're seeing some frozen nitrogen. I'm going to slowly let this back in because you don't want to mess around. Well, we just messed around. <laughs> I didn't want that to tip over. That's what we didn't want to have happen. <laughs> Is it Sorry. okay? Yeah, I, yeah, everything's fine. What happened was we were talking about pressure and vacuums and things. We we were we were removing all the nitrogen that evaporated from the bell jar. But then what happened was my, my, little, my little thing tipped off its stand. So we had a lot of liquid nitrogen touching the aluminum. And so it boiled away really quickly and that increased the pressure inside the bell jar. And so uh, the bell jar popped off. 
but it's it's still fine. Okay, I guess that's um, a good way to end. Wait, that was a very you, exciting end. <laughs> do, you, do you not have time to do a marshmallow? I do, I do, but I didn't want to, I know people have busy things, busy schedules. The only thing about these marshmallows, I hope it does anything, because um, I'm not a little kid anymore, so I don't really snack on marshmallows anymore. So these are pretty old, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see if we can get them to do something. So a marshmallow is made out of sugar and air, and it's the air that, pump, that puffs up. So let's turn this back on. We'll bring this in closer. Now this vacuum pump, it has to pop. Okay, now. I see them getting a little bit bigger. So what happens usually with marshmallows is there's air mixed in with the sugar. That air, there's nothing pushing on it from the outside when you put it in a bell jar. So the marshmallow puffs up. But then sugar isn't like a real balloon. So the sugar will crack and then the air can come out of the little bubbles because the, the sugar is cracked. And then if we put uh, air pressure back on, the marshmallows will shrivel up. So they're bigger at first and then they get smaller. And then when we put air in, they get even smaller. So let me turn this off now. and we'll let the air back in. And now, so those bubbles that had air in them, because the sugar isn't as stretchy as a balloon, those, those bubbles broke and we took the air out of the marshmallow. And then when we put atmospheric pressure back on them, the marshmallows are really shriveling. But if you're from Warren County and you see Linda or Tom Channel, tell them thank you for donating these marshmallows to science. <laughs>